Thank you. Thank you. This has been a wonderful day. I'm overstimulated. I'll try and calm down a bit. Um, I'm going to talk about movies. Um, I think we have to recognize soberly that the perception of poverty by most, the vast majority of Americans comes from mass culture and what they see on the screen, the little screen and the big screen. Uh, it's too big of a subject uh, for the time I'm given, so I'm going to talk about a few movies. But first, let me say that I think, well, the first, movies started dealing with poverty rights in the beginning of the art farm or of the, of the commercial movies. Because for one thing, in Hollywood at least, uh, many of the, uh, the pioneers were themselves poor. Many were Jewish immigrants and, and, and refugees from all over Europe. So there was a very much of a consciousness of poverty. But naturally, it was turned in, into popular forms. I would say that by and large, the movies gave us three basic perceptions. Uh, the first was, that the, uh, was pity for the poor, a kind of sentimentalized, ain't it awful kind of thing. Genuine, sometimes, but, but rather sentimental view of it. Um, the second was really much more associated with the 30s and 40s, um, and that was the militant, angry poor that were fighting for justice, very much influenced by socialism and, and, and Marxism at that time. Um, and then finally, I think the image that we've got that's most relevant to the poverty we're seeing now was the sense of just the lost, alienated, desperate poor. And I'm going to just talk about some, some films, I think, that represent uh, these particular perceptions. As to the sympathetic figure, I would say uh, the most influential figure in film history was Charlie Chaplin. And his uh, little tramp is probably historically the most remarkable achievement. Because you have to remember that the vagrant, the ho hobo, the homeless of that time, uh, in the first part of the century was associated with anarchists. So the tramp in that kind of tramp outfit often would be pictured as having a bomb in his hand. He, they were the terrorists of the time. So for Chaplin to turn the little tramp into what was unquestionably the most beloved figure in movies for the first you know, decades is a remarkable accomplishment. And I want to come back, I'll tie this together as to why I think he was able to do that. The second image, again, I'm going to be concrete and specific about it. The second image of the militant, I think we can see best represented in the 1939 film Grapes of Wrath, the character of Tom Joad played by Henry Fonda. Uh, now, Kevin has forbidden me from using the word about people, poor people from Oklahoma, but part of my family were Arkies, so I can say that. We were poor people from Arkansas. Um, but this was, these were basically the exploited migrant laborers. And uh, uh, Tom Joad, uh, played by uh, Henry Fonda, I think stands out uh, as a remarkable, uh, lasting figure of that. And again, we want to figure out why. There was also at that time in American films a kind of populist view of the poor that you see in the films of Frank Capra, Preston Sturges, even some of the comedies like My Man Godfrey. This was, again, a very good, genial kind of view of the poor as being just good, ordinary people, kind of the people on the bus, and it happened one night. Uh, they have solidarity with each other, but it's a somewhat sentimentalized view. It's not a very real view of what the poverty was there. Well-intentioned, uh, but, but sentimentalized. I think the third uh, image that I think is the most lasting of what I think is the most characteristic of American com uh, poor now um, are the two street hustlers from Midnight Cowboy, a 1969 film in which you have a sex hustler played by John Voight and a crippled addict, a street person played by Dustin Hoffman. Now these two characters ended up on the, on the cover of Life magazine. And what it, uh, what it depicted 
was really a psychological and spiritual degradation rather than a, a, a material poverty. So let me now examine, because I think there is a commonality in why these three films are considered classics. Um, two of them won the Academy Award. But that to this day, that at least film students and serious people uh, in the film uh, art form uh, still regard these films so highly. Um, and I think each one of them had what I would call, and I think this is the key to good movies, I'm going to mar borrow the t phrase from Martin Buber, they each had an I-thou moment. It wasn't the story, it wasn't even necessarily the characterizations, it was that inexplicable moment, maybe one, only one or two in those remarkable films in which there is that I-thou moment. It's sometimes just a meeting of eyes in which, as Buber described the thou, in which the other person sees the full potential, the mystery, the beauty even, of another person. Now, this is first powerfully represented in 1931 at the end of Chaplin's best film, City Lights. And for those of you who haven't seen it or don't remember it, it's a silent film. At the end, the little tramp, once again on the street. Chaplin, incidentally, had been a street person as a kid. He, among all the filmmakers, he knew poverty um, personally. Um, at the end, the little tramp character encounters a girl who had been blind, and through circumstances, he had helped her actually find a new life and find her sight. And she sees this little tramp as her benefactor for the first time. And in a silent uh, title, she simply says, you? And he nods, and the title says, and he says, uh, you can see now? And her title says, yes, I can see now. Well, see, that isn't just visual sight. And the moment between Chaplin and the actress of those eyes connecting was an I-thou moment. And incidentally, that moment in film history inspired filmmakers around the world because they could start to see what the potential of this medium was. Similarly, similarly in Grapes of Wrath, uh, this is John Ford's film from the John Steinbeck uh, novel. Uh, Tom Joad is also now going to become a fugitive again. He's a militant. He's been involved in violence. He's, he's committed a class struggle as much as, as justice. And he's having to say goodbye to his mother. He's going to leave his mother and family again. And he gives a famous speech, and it's still a pretty powerful speech, about solidarity with the poor and the proletariat and things like that. It still works, but it's a little calculated. It's, it's kind of a political speech it gives at the end. I think what actually makes that scene work and memorable is the eyes of the mother played by Jane Darwell. It's her look at her son departing that transcends social justice. This is about human solidarity and, and communication on the deepest level. This isn't about class struggle. And I think that's what make the, makes those characters memorable. Now, in Midnight Cowboy, at the, it's again at the very end, that the street hustler, John Voigt, holding his dead partner in his, in his arms is where death becomes an I-thou moment. And I think that makes that, that film suddenly leap and transcend beyond exploitation and degradation to something, again, that we would call real solidarity. And I think these, these truthful moments are really what make good films great films and what make films last. And I think this is what we can learn from these films in our dealing with poverty. Uh, I myself was from a poor family um, in the Depression. We didn't uh, think of our, ourselves as poor because we weren't spiritually poor. We had faith, family, and community. We just didn't have any money. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. And I think without faith, family, and, and, and basic relations of community, a living community, a, commu a faith community, 
I don't think un unless those ingredients are there, we're ever going to really address the heart of modern poverty. And I think that's the truth that these films tell us and why they last. Thank you.